started. Uh, <clears throat> thank you all for coming to the call today. Um, and I just wanted to set up the, the briefing here. Uh, Ted Funk is going to provide a, a, a briefing here on the uh, proposed short-term, <clears throat> enhanced short-term forecast project from the uh, Central Region Grid Methodology Advisory Team. Uh, <clears throat> what we're doing is inviting your office to be uh, to participate uh, as a test bed to look at uh, you know the methodologies, tools, workload issues, et cetera, for uh, ensuring that our enhanced short-term grids and services are you know are the best they could be and kept up to date on that. Uh, we found the testbed uh, process to be very successful with the extended forecast methodology. Uh, the forecast offices that were involved there provide us with tremendous feedback uh, that allowed us to. Um, really shift gears and, and improve uh, the process. Um, and it was all due to the feedback that we got from them and, and the uh, uh, both good and bad feedback. So what we're doing is inviting you to be a, uh, be a participant in this. Um, it's up to the local office to uh, decide uh, through the uh, union management uh, lot process, decide if they want to be a test bed and participate in this. So. Uh, Ted's going to present uh, information about what we're proposing here and what and what you'll be faced with if you want to become a test bed, and then you can make that decision and let us know, um, and then we hopefully can get started uh, with test bed operations, you know, in early February. So let me uh, pass it over to Ted, and he can uh, start the briefing. Okay, thanks, Pete, and hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to be talking, as Pete mentioned, I'm going to give an overview of the enhanced short-term forecast proposal that we've come up with. Um, each of you have received documents that are very detailed, a philosophy document and a playbook document, which provide a lot of information about what we're doing, why we're trying to do it, what expectations are, concerns, and a whole slew of, of, of material, and that's done on purpose uh, so you do have a good expectation and have uh, good knowledge going into this uh, whether you want to participate. And that's something we did learn when we did the extended test bed uh, previously. So if you have not read those documents, I would highly encourage you to do so because they have a lot more detail than what I'll be presenting. Uh, nevertheless, uh, what I present today will hopefully summarize that information pretty well, maybe present a little bit of new information as well. Uh, hopefully along the way we'll answer some questions you may already have, but we'll be glad to try to answer other ones that you have at the end of the briefing. I'll talk for about 50 minutes. Uh, by then you'll be tired of hearing me, so then we'll open that up to the floor. Um, right now the enhanced short-term forecast is basically what it says there at the bottom. In a nutshell, it's an integration between a digital forecast base, database and decision support in the short term. So let's look at our current approach to the short-term grids and how are things kind of done now. This, these are kind of general statements, but I think they reflect uh, the state of being uh, if you look at things at a whole, but they don't necessarily mean that everyone does or doesn't do uh, what we're about to show. And the first one is individual and office variability in forecast services. Uh, different offices do things differently. I'm talking about kind of the methodology. They have different approaches to doing the grids, uh, different operational paradigms, so to speak. People have different personal styles. There's different smart tool uses from one office, one office to another office and also within the same office. I think we all have our, our, our personal favorites of what to use, how we like to go about constructing the grids. And you know, that creates a lot of differences, a lot of variability. And it also is based on whether a person is very conscientious in uh, their, their approach to short-term grids and the effort and the detail that they put into it, or whether they're more complacent. Uh, not that they don't care and not that they're not professionals and doing a good job, but that maybe they're just uh, sending it out at the predefined times and therefore then kind of letting the, the database go and doing other things and maybe not uh, putting as much information or, or specific uh, detail into those grids as they could. And that's what we're trying to address is, is look at the, the different approaches and how can we do that better within this uh, project. Uh, if that is the case in any of us, uh, there can be, especially if, if it, the approach is a little bit more leaning toward the complacent side, it could be perceived that our grids are good enough. Okay. Um, 
we may think they're good enough, but perhaps our users don't. Maybe they have critical decisions to be made that are based on certain criteria that we don't think is a big deal, which could be. So, uh, and the other problem is that a lot of times, or at least sometimes, our grids don't match reality, and, and that's really not a good situation, as you obviously know, when we don't get it right at the beginning. So what does that mean? How are we going to forecast well if we can't get it right in the beginning? It's kind of like a model not being initialized well, how you're not going to get a, a great model run if you don't have a good initialization. So that's what we want to kind of try to do. We want to try to match what's happening now so when uh, folks and high-end, low-end users look out and need one information and they see one thing happening but our forecast is another thing, that's not a good situation. And that doesn't uh, lend toward customer, customers using and being loyal to the information that we provide. Forecasts or packages, this is more uh, in the past, but it still uh, exists some today, even though we are evolving as an agency. Uh, but forecasts are more packages, uh, at least to some extent, issued certainly at predefined times with relatively infrequent updates in between, which can create stale and inaccurate info, again, if you're not uh, kind of maintaining more of a constant uh, awareness of those grids. Obviously, things go out around 4 p.m., 4 a.m., give or take a little bit. And most offices do a, a standard late morning and mid to late evening update. So we'll assume that maybe about four are done for, for, for time during, during a 24-hour period. But again, if we're not updating proactively in between or even at those times in detail, again, that has to, uh, we have to look and take a look at that and why that is. Because sometimes these forecasts may lack definitiveness, decisiveness, um, deterministic type uh, wording and approaches, and temporal and spatial detail and timing. Again, this is not meant to demean any one or any office. This is just kind of the, uh, I think, the state of the way things can tend to be at some, some times. There's, there's, Weather Service has great people and very uh, diligent and, and enthusiastic forecasters do an awesome job. But I think, nevertheless, we need to look at ourselves and personally reflect on how we're doing and how we can improve. So what are the results of this current approach? Well, one of the things that uh, we hear at, from headquarters, some of the information that comes in about the NDFD, some of the complaints with regard to the short-term grids is that uh, they often have no more detail uh, than the extended forecast, and they often don't match reality. Now, obviously, that's not a good thing. I mean, if we can't get more specific, I can't say the word, if we can't get more specific in the very near term than we can at day five and six and seven, then there's something not right there, and we were trained to be able to do better than that. And if we're not matching reality, again, uh, if we're not starting right, how can we forecast right? So that was the basis of one of the original recommendations from the grid team was to place more emphasis in the short term, and that's where this enhanced short-term forecast philosophy was born out of. As we've seen, the different types of approaches and methodologies that we have, mindsets and methodologies, procedures that we have towards short-term forecasting can lead to, can lead to erratic or inconsistent information within the same office and certainly from office to office, and that can make users ponder how reliable and how usable is this information. The habits uh, that we have right now may create unnecessary uncertainty in the short term, which is not based on scientific limitations. What I mean by that is that um, if we're just putting general uh, things in the short term, 30% chance today, and we can, and we're not putting specific information, detail, gradients, timing information, then we're putting a level of uncertainty in those grids because we're not, you know, we could do better, basically. We can do better than that because we have the knowledge and experience uh, to be able to refine what we have in there, which does then lend toward better user support. But So we can artificially create uncertainty in, in the short term. Uh, our uncertainty is certainly um, valid, and, and it's what happens in, in meteorology, especially the longer you go out. And I'm not saying that you cannot have uncertainty in the short term. Obviously, there is. But obviously, I think there's some that's in there that maybe we could get rid of just by being a little bit more diligent in, in how we approach things. Ultimately, uh, this could threaten credibility and jeopardize quality decision support. What is the future of the weather service? Where are we going? And, and how is what we're doing now basically tying into that? Well, you may or you may not have seen the strategic plan and the roadmaps uh, 
that have been developed or being developed here for the next 5, 10, 15 years or so. And those are based on innovation. Uh, to build a weather-ready nation by meeting America's weather needs, evolving requirements. Okay, A lot of uh, innovative ideas in there if you, if you look at those. And, and, and if you have, you might think, wow, how are we going to do that? Or how are we going to get to that point? Because when we innovate and we come up with a lot of new ideas and we try to change, there's always some folks who will question that or will look at the negative side of things. Well, we can't do that because of this obstacle or that roadblock or there's fear or there's a reluctancy to change because I'm comfortable in what I'm doing and get out of the status quo. But it's those type of individuals who have the vision, who have the forward thinking to not let, I mean, that recognize those, those roadblocks and obstacles, but don't let that deter them from moving forward and, uh, and, and looking out for a greater good in what we can do, learn from the past and the present, and therefore and try to shape the future. I mean, that's kind of what we're, we're looking at here because that's the type of approach that really has shaped this country, and that's the type of approach we need to also help shape us as an agency and as an individuals, not just professionally, but personally as well. So habits and behaviors in, in our future are based on extreme diligence and expertise, continuous situational awareness, interpretation of high-resolution data sets. And when we got the HRRR, and other data sets that are coming online, those will continue to improve, but they'll never replace us. And we need to be able to take a look at that information, kind of stay over top of them, figure out what's good and not good coming out of these data sets, and, and convey this information to our users so that we can maintain a constant user support. That we The ideas of NextGen and 40 WeatherCube and, and other methodologies and, and, and things that will come in our future, um, we need to be ready for that and build those behaviors and habits. So. Part of the ESTF here is not just about creating mesoscale forecasts it's in detail. It's really bigger than that. It's really about addressing the approach that we take toward mesoscale forecasts and how much effort and uh, how much uh, we really want to get in there and make sure it's the best possible information that we can because ultimately it's what our customers will see. Okay, So it's approaching the mindset and behavior from which the mesoscale detail and forecasting will naturally fall out. And it does take advantage of the talents that we have in this area. Okay, the operational paradigm in the future, if you look at this, you think, wow, that's pretty much the same as what we do now or what we should be doing. It's consistent, detailed, accurate info and decision support to maximize safety and economic productivity. Um, and, and, yeah, are we there yet on that first line? Are we consistent? Are we detailed? Are we accurate? Well, as much as we can be, but I think certainly we can do better. And again, that, that gets into the approach of forecasting. But the bigger thing here is the operational paradigm of the future isn't really that different from what it should be now or maybe what it is for some folks. So ESTF is not some new huge uh, thing that we're trying to do. It's basically standardizing or formalizing and, uh, and try to develop the best process for doing what we already should be doing right now and in which some folks are already are doing pretty well. All this will lead to the NWS being indispensable. Not just reliable, uh, not just relevant, but indispensable. There's a lot of competition out there, a lot of providers of weather information. Users need information for their livelihood, for their businesses, for their well-being. They will get it somewhere, and we need them to get it from us. Well, the enhanced short term, uh, we feel, is integral to this future. It addresses the NDFD complaints. Right now, uh, the NDFD is not where we would like to have it to leverage all the enhanced short term information that we're trying to do here. But again, we can't let a roadblock now get in the way from the approach and what we're trying to do for the greater good. Because the NDFD will go in the future to a two and a half kilometer grid. Right now it's five. We've gone to two and a half in, in region, central region. Temporarily, I'm not sure how long this will take, but the plan is to go to uh, hourly through 36 hours, and that would be able to obviously take advantage of, of hourly forecasts. But right now, we're not sure when that will happen, and, and that may not happen for a little while. The one that could happen more quickly here is updating twice an hour. Right now, NDFD updates once at the top of each hour. Um, if it updates twice per hour, say at the bottom and the top, then when we make updates, they will show up more quickly when we publish that information up to NDFD. But there's other ways that folks can get our hourly information right now uh, besides NDFD. 
And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. The enhanced short term capitalizes on forecaster talent, diligence, experience to produce detailed timing and precision in the short term. All right. We have, like I say, we have that talent. We, we can do better than this. I mean, we were trained to be meteorologists who have who were passionate about uh, what we're doing. And that's probably why we got into meteorology. We were trained to be uh, forecasters. And we take pride in what we're doing. So this is a chance to really use those talents uh, and expertise that we have and put them to good work here. So something like 30% chance isn't good enough anymore. 30% chance is just more probabilistic and doesn't really hone in on, on where we can get more specific in the forecast. And today is just too large of a block of time to really be specific when users need information more on an hourly scale for a lot of their decisions. Enhanced short term is decision support, OK? We had heard some couple comments uh, wondering whether enhanced short term, if we're putting more resources and time into that, hey, that may take away from our opportunity to provide on-site decision support, um, outreach, and, and working with our partners, customers, emergency managers, and so on. We understand that, and obviously that is huge, and that's why we exist, uh, working with those folks. But our service is based on our forecast. We provide better forecast, better science. That is our service. So they're, they're the same. They're one and the same. Better service, I mean, I'm sorry, better forecast naturally yield better service because they are basically the same. It's a synergistic partnership between science and service. So when we are on site uh, doing support here, uh, whether we can do it now or we'll do it in the future, we and our users can pull directly from our database and from our grids. And there is information out there right now that they can directly pull hourly information from. And they will know that it's our best, not that, hey, is this reliable or can I use this? They will know that because we have those habits and we're putting out that information uh, routinely uh, that they can rely on, uh, again, for us to be indispensable. And it will provide better service to all users, not just when you're doing on-site support, obviously, because the short term is always high impact to someone. I mean, just as a quick example, you get the contractor pouring concrete and needs to know, hey, what time exactly is it going to rain, when's it going to start, when's it gonna, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, there's a user right there. So basically and ultimately that enhances our credibility, the utility of the information and service we provide, and that trust and loyalty and indispensability. We talked to some people over in our friends over in the eastern region here. They are doing some enhanced short term. I have a few comments later. This is one that fits in well here. Uh, this person stated that there's no doubt in my mind our users are best served with a frequently updated forecast with high detail in the early parts of it. We have the skill over the models in this area and can really provide service. All right, here's the proposed test bed offices that we're starting with and which we're briefing here. We came up with these for uh, several regions, uh, reasons, I'm sorry. And there are three clusters of four similar to what we had in the extended test beds, although these are different offices from the extended test beds. And they're at the four or three corners of the uh, region. And obviously, there is geographic diversity amongst them, unique weather concerns. Obviously, in the West, fire weather is huge. And you have uh, terrain differences and time uh, zone difference. You guys up in the Great Lakes, you obviously have a lot of mesoscale effects going on. In the winter, you have lake effect. You have big marine responsibilities and, and a, lot of, a host of uh, things that uh, mesoscale detail can help with. And here in the Ohio and Mid Mississippi Valley, we have precipitation phase concerns and, and, and precip type um, and lots of, lots of different types of weather that come through here, and including QLTS type activity in the spring. So these are the type of things we want to take advantage of and seeing how these different uh, workloads uh, will be based on different types of weather, different uh, areas of priorities, uh, and, and different uh, locations and, and the users we have within our different areas. So. A lot of your offices have also expressed some local interest in being part of that. So this is what we came up with. But of course, like Pete said, it is up to you in a lot of process whether you want to participate. We'll talk about that a little bit. A bit. The target dates, the start date is targeted for February 6th, which is a Monday, the day after the Super Bowl. Uh, so that's when we would like to have everything uh, down and ready to go at your offices if you decide to come on board. And the end date is. Uh, projected right now is May 31st. So that's about or almost four months. 
which can be not long enough if you're trying to make significant changes from what your common practice is right now. And if it's messy and whatnot, it can take a while to really get used to the process and say, hey, this actually is working pretty well, or maybe after several months, this doesn't work very well. And that's what we need to know, and that's why we test. But on the other hand, four months does give you a good idea, and you can kind of get a good idea of some winter weather and some spring weather and how this might work and where adjustments might need to be made. Now, after the test is over, we may continue, or you have the option to continue doing enhanced short-term after that. That's what the extended test bed did after that uh, the official test bed period ended, because now you have gotten more used to the process and you want to continue on, and that's what we would hope. Well, what about the availability of our information to users now? Let's assume that technology doesn't change at all and there aren't better methods to get our information out there on an hourly basis. Let's assume NDFD uh, never does change here over the next number of years. Uh, how can folks get that information now so they can take advantage of this extra detail and, and, and approach to how we're doing the grids? Well, let's start with the NDFD, okay? Despite it being uh, its, its state of being right now, some of the information on, um, I mean, the information on some of these forecast variables is at every three hours, but we still need to make sure that those are correct. I mean, there could be no change to the resolution, spatial or temporal, of, of the grids and NDFD, but we still need to make sure that what's up there now is accurate and does represent our latest thinking uh, and, and our best, okay? So we need to be diligent in ensuring that and not just issuing something at a predefined time and then let it go until the next time it shows up. All right, our point and click forecast. These four matters uh, do pretty well in trying to get some detail into them, and we, we're working with the, the developers of this to try to see how that fits in with what we're trying to, to do here. Um, so point and click certainly is one area that uh, can leverage some of this information. But the real advantage right now is through the weather activity planner, which I don't know if how much you guys advertise this to your users, but I've got a couple examples here of folks who use this a lot. I know our WCM who goes on uh, and does on-site support, say at the Kentucky Derby here in Louisville every year, he uses this information very much and, and they like this information as well. So this is hourly information in graphical and tabular format in the mediagrams that is directly coming out of our grid. So we upload and make updates, upload and publish this information and folks will have it, uh, whether or not NDFD is, is of the time and spatial uh, resolution that we would like it to be. Because weather, hourly weather is out there, okay? It's out there on smartphones, for one, as we know. Here's an Android user guide, that I don't know what app this is, but it says where you can touch a specific hour and you can get a detailed forecast for every hour. And I also, the other day, asked my son about his Android phone and I said, hey, what kind of weather apps you got on that? And he pulled up a Weather Channel application that uh, gave him hourly information for, I don't know, 24 hours at least or so out there that I could tell. So it's out there, and there is competition, and we can't be behind the eight ball here. We need to provide uh, frequent and good information so we can maximize our service and our utility to our users. So here's a couple of those comments I, I referred to. Because um, it, it is important. I mean, we're doing this for our partners, our customers, uh, and all the users out there. And, and I fully believe that while we understand a lot of who our customers and partners are, we may not understand who all they are and certainly what exactly their needs are. So this kind of adds a little bit of uh, extra information about why we need to be doing this. And here's information from the Kentucky, um, Kentucky, yeah, Missouri and Kansas Department of Transportation. As you would expect, precipitation information is very critical to their operations, the type, the intensity, the duration, when is this going to start, when is it going to end, how long is it going to last, how much, and uh, the timing there. And not just during an event, uh, when they're out on the road, but before event, because they've got to make staffing decisions. And they need to know how much chemicals to carry and things and what routes to go and, and things of that nature. So they need information. and, and, and the more active we are in getting the, the most current information out there as, as quickly as we can, that will definitely help their operations and the economy of the, of the area, basically. Uh, and, and, you know, so commerce can move across roads. So they do look at hourly forecast information, and they do use our hourly weather planner. There's one example of they do use that. 
and they look at the times on our information. How, how and they monitor that closely, and they look at timestamps because, as you would think, I mean, it makes sense that if you see a timestamp that's more closer to now, you would assume that that information has been looked at, and people have assessed what's happening and made any updates as needed, versus one that's old and you know three, four, five, six hours old. Then you have to wonder, well, is this information still correct, or, or you know, is I don't know now. There's more uncertainty in their decisions. And lastly, the forecasts are compared between us and you know other vendors, other suppliers of weather information, as we talked about. There's the Milwaukee Airport and trying to ensure that the runways and taxiways are clear so airplanes can land and take off. They're considering using a private vendor to provide better hourly snow amounts to support their ops. Here's a good example showing how not just hourly, but almost every minute of information is, is critical to them because the cost per minute for delays because of snow is about $1,500. So there's an economic uh, exclamation point, so to speak. They make frequent use of the hourly weather planner, again, uh, and when it differs from the TAP, they call the WFO to inquire, so consistency in forecast service with us is important, and we'll talk about that more later. And also, again, they need the detail uh, to support their operations. If you're a leadership buff, you may you probably know who Stephen Covey is, who came up with the seven habits of highly effective people. And one of his is begin with the end in mind. Well, the end is basically uh, ours and any organization's uh, vision of where they want to go, what the end state is, what the you know what the optimal state is of, of where they are now versus you know where they want to be. Um, so it's, it's a vision, it's, it's, it's a mission statement, so to speak, and this basically summarizes ours. It's decisive, high temporal, spatial resolution forecasts and frequent updates. Uh, that match OBS and expected mesoscale trends, and they result in indispensable, accurate support for many users. Well, what's the beginning? Well, that's where we are now, and we've talked about that. Our current mindsets, our procedures toward forecasting and grids, and the variability that occurs in, in, you know, in different ways through habits and also methodologies. The process. Well, that's no, no, this isn't rocket science either. It's how we get there. And that's where leadership, innovation, and pursuit to test and attain the best routes and methods to that end. I mean, if we're going to attain that end, we have to pursue it. And when you pursue something, you run into concerns, you run into obstacles. That's where we need to decide, hey, what are the best routes? And this first predefined route may not be the best, and we need to see how we can alter that route to get around that obstacle and still get to our goal um, so that we can meet that end. So it takes perseverance in what we're doing here as well. But any, uh, any worthy goal uh, that we think will improve us as individuals and as an agency and the service that we provide is worth attaining. So therefore, it's worth uh, pursuing and persevering through those rough edges try to get to where we need to be to be indispensable in our future. So what's needed? What's needed is talented, experienced, passionate, and open-minded staff to provide optimal service, flexible, proactive, accountable, and forward-thinking individuals and operations, okay, and streaming mesoscale forecasts, which are customer-centric decision support. Streaming mesoscale forecasts, meaning that the information that we uh, disseminate is always our best. It's not best at some predefined time. It's best at all times. So instead of putting all our eggs into, say, a 4 p.m. and 4 a.m. forecast, we're spreading those eggs out over all the, four, all, you know, the entire 24-hour period. So the workload is spread out, and also the information is always constant and relevant uh, to our users. So it's kind of a streaming uh, uh, forecast that has the detail in there and it's updated as need be in order to maintain that uh, reliability. So in this whole area here, uh, we have laid out what we feel uh, in this proposal as a very good foundation um, to build upon based on a lot of work, a lot of input from a lot of people, and trying to develop what we think is the best uh, process and, and the way to go about things, how to build on that foundation. But we need builders, okay, because we don't know everything, and we haven't necessarily accounted for everything. And there will be concerns that will come up that, yeah, obstacles that 
we can't let deter us, but we have to deal with and figure out how to rectify that situation. So we need builders to help us. Uh, and that's why we need you guys to help us to learn, okay, what is the best process to get from where we are to where we need to be? And maybe the process that we've laid out isn't the best process, or maybe it's good, but it needs a little bit of tweaking here and there. So that's, that's what we need. We're going to learn from you just as you're learning from us. So this is your opportunity to be a valued part of that process, all right? Because you're going to determine the best way forward to that end. Uh, you'll try out, suggest new techniques and ideas. Okay, well, again, we have a baseline, but you're free to alter that baseline, depend, you know, depending on what we see and, and, and what's best for the entire project. You'll be able to provide us feedback and opinions to help guide the experiments, and ultimately, however, this uh, enhanced short-term goes forward in the central region at some point. But as Pete said, testbed participation is certainly voluntary. You don't have to, and it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with you saying, hey, we've got other priorities and there's other things going on here that we just don't have time for this, but we, you know, it's good, but we don't have time, and that's fine. But uh, we'd like to have you participate, and we think your office will really add some good information to us and really help us out in our pursuit here as we team together to do this. And if you do decide to participate, then your lot will also decide how best to meet the, uh, the goals and the expectations uh, based on the resources you have locally. All right, so let's look at the, some of the expectations now. But again, this is detailed in the documents that we have given you. So this is kind of an overview. So again, please refer to those to uh, help out with what we're saying here. Short-term forecaster is required for each shift. Again, that's something we want to experiment with. I don't know how your operations are set up right now. Some offices have short-term, long-term. Um, uh, if that or mesoscale, synoptic scale, that type of thing. So we would like to have a person, and we just call it short-term forecast or as a generic name, but it's a person who's kind of uh, dedicated to the short period. Uh, we, did, uh, we, we define the, the, the short-term period as being the first three periods, kind of like today, tonight, tomorrow, or tomorrow, tomorrow night, the next day, which is roughly the first 36 hours of the forecast. Now, that doesn't mean that one person is going to do all this. Uh, because we advocate the effective use of the operational team to assist and support. And that's no different than what you guys currently do right now. I mean, you have a certain number of people and resources that you can use to get the total job done. Information comes out not just from a person. It's not from forecaster X or Y, but it's from the office and from the weather service. So we're only as good as everyone and the resources that we have. So. Uh, we certainly want you to use your team. This could be other forecasters. Maybe the long-term person can help out with the short-term before they're initializing the extended forecast, or an ex-shift person, or certainly a management member, or H&T, or, or intern can maybe pitch in. Uh, again, this is in order to get the total job done. But again, no different from what we've done in the past, so nothing really terribly new there. Temporal grid resolution is defined at right. Here you see what uh, the requirement is for the enhanced short term. A few of those at the top are already basically hourly, so there shouldn't be uh, any uh, difference there. And the ones at the bottom pretty much don't change in temporal resolution, although that doesn't mean that you just let them go. You still need to get the detail and update them frequently as needed to match reality and expected uh, short term trends. Now there is one uh, new grid in here called POP12 that will take hourly pops and create a 12-hour grid from it. Right now, NDFD just shows a 12-hour pop, so that's basically for uh, internal collaboration purposes with your testbed neighbors, and that can be easily done by, it, it, it takes all the, the pops into hourlies and then creates, from the max of those values, it creates a max into pop 12, just like NDFD does it. And that's easily done by use of a smart tool that literally, literally takes a few seconds, and we do it here. Um, but the main changes are in the POP, weather and sky, where we want to go down to hourly resolution. Now, a number of offices already do that. Maybe, maybe yours does. Uh, that's the thing you're creating, manually creating each grid at every hour resolution. We'll talk about that in a second. So as we mentioned before, definitive, decisiveness, uh, deterministic grids. Instead of 30% chance, maybe you go scattered or widespread, or uh, maybe you put it just for this afternoon between 2 and 5 p.m. because, you know, convection, for instance, won't initiate before 18Z or, you know, whatever, you know, 2 p.m. or whatever time that might be. Um, so we're more, more deterministic. 
and the processes and the detail and the, and the gradients, we try to get there as much as possible. Now, no one's expecting anyone to completely model exactly what's happening. You're not going to be able to get every every storm, uh, every thunderstorm, or every uh, you know you know lake effect snow bands. If you have multiple banding and they shift north or south, you're not going to be able to get every little last one of those or or whatever the local effects are. But we're we're expecting again to have more detail than maybe what is in there uh, now, at least. Uh, in some, in some, you know, instances where more could be added. Consistency in other forecast services, we'll mention that uh, in a little bit. And an emphasis on a short-term forecast or during high-impact weather when information is critical. It's easy to do this when it's a quiet weather day and all you do is make a few tweaks and you're done. But on the, uh, the higher end and the high-impact weather when you have significant winter weather or spring severe weather, that's when short-term forecasts are more important, and users need that information so that they can make the calls they need to make to, uh, to support what they're doing. And I know the school systems uh, rely heavily on information like that and updates as uh, during hazardous weather. So this will never replace, say, a warning, a short fuse warning. If it comes pushed, comes down to shove, and you don't have the people available to uh, do everything, you have to prioritize and certainly high impacts, short-term fuse convective warnings would take uh, highest priority. But we don't want to just eliminate the, the ESTF person just because we have high-end weather going on, because that's when they're most needed. Here's the hybrid schedule driven, event driven approach. These are the eight times uh, every three hours that we have the designated. And these are consistent with uh, what folks in the eastern region are doing right now because they are, have started some of this. So this will help lend toward um, consistency in each office in central region, kind of looking at the grids uh, routinely at specified times so they can make sure they, they stay relevant and publishing, you know, updating and publishing this information at, at kind of uh, the same overall time frame so we get the information as a whole out there. Uh, and it also does maintain consistency then better across regions as well. Now. With the NDFD only updating once an hour, you've got to get this information up to it by 45 minutes after the hour. So while the updates are scheduled for the bottom of the hour, I mean, there's a little bit of leeway in there, but you want to make sure that you get your information up by 45 after if you want to display it on that next update at the top of the hour. Uh, if you just happen to miss it, well, that's, you know, that's not the way you, you'd like it to be, but certainly, as we talked about before, there are other avenues from which this information is disseminated through. And we will be providing a cron that will automatically uh, send published grids to NDFD as a safety net in case uh, perhaps you forget to do it. Event driven, no different from now. In between the three hours, if you have weather, three hours really is a big time. So we want folks to really get in there and see what type of uh, changes can I make to provide better information, better service from which users can base their decisions. Uh, we provided some information in those uh, the, the documents that give you suggested event-driven criteria to go by to make your decision whether to do event-driven, but ultimately that is up to you. But we like for it to be more, a little bit more frequent than frequent than perhaps maybe it is. I mean, and I don't know. Maybe you guys do it uh, really well, and you're already on board and doing this, and that's great. We can use you guys to really help lead this effort because you're already doing what we're trying to get at. Update procedures. There is uh, observations. Uh, what's actually going on will be initialized into uh, GFE using a smart tool at each update. We'll talk about which one here in a second. And that will facilitate a common starting point across the testbed offices, just like we now have a common starting point when we initialize and are extended. The grids from there will be relevant. You'll look at them and see, OK, do my short-term grids remain relevant and consistent with those observations? And using our expertise and what we're trained to do, do they remain uh, consistent with what I think is going to happen here over the next 6 to 12 hours or longer, if the case may be? Um, so that's kind of how you, you approach things. And you know, what the suggestion is on this is, as we mentioned before, you're not going to do grids necessary every hour. I mean, that's, that's asking a lot. So a suggestion would be to create grids every three hours and then interpolate in between. And that might be common practice now anyway. So the idea is we're getting trend information in there well, and we're not just putting bigger blocks, but we're getting actual trends, which can help. And when you're doing hourly 
resolution that can show you when things may start, when they may end, how long they may last, things of that nature. So that would be a suggestion to help with, with workload issues. But let me emphasize that most of your changes will be in your first 12 hours. Um, despite the short term being the first three periods, roughly 0 to 36, you're not going to be updating 36 hours worth of grids at every update. You're going to be doing most of your work in the first 12 and perhaps in the first six hours of the forecast um, to make sure that everything you know, is good in the early part of it from which things could naturally fall out as it's continuing to be reliable from there. However, if uh, new, when new information comes in or when trends suggest that, hey, uh, what we have now in the rest of the, in the short term doesn't match up with what's going on now or what I expect to go on, here, go on over the next several hours, then collaborate with your fellow test bed offices and make those revisions and get that information out right away. I mean, don't wait for maybe what we wait for now, which is a predefined time to issue that information. Let's get it out because, again, we want our customers to be able to go in, get information, and know that that's the best that we have, and it's always as, as good as, you know, it's not something that's going to be old information. It's new, it's relevant, and it's as reliable as it's, we can make it. So a revision could uh, change from being a, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, a revision, a revision could range from being a significant change, um, depending on if the situation is very variable, to a simple tweak. I mean, if it's a nice weather day, you still do the scheduled updates, you populate the grids, you maybe make a few minor alterations, you publish, and basically you're done. Here's a few examples of things we're looking at. In terms of updates for these are just a number of examples. There, there's more, but these are just a few that uh, that you might try to, to model in your, in your mesoscale forecasting here. And those are in your your uh, document, so you can easily go through there. But a few things: we, we, if you really don't think it's precipitate, then put zero pops. Don't put 10 or 14 or what have you. Um, same thing with cloud cover. It's cloudy. Go 100. And the last two get at being more proactive and say even watches. When we know something, let's send it out and tell folks about it and not wait for any certain time to do so. Of course, we need to collaborate uh, for those uh, you know, later parts of the short term. So we just don't want to send something out without uh, discussing with our neighbors. But again, that's no different than today. Here are the smart tools. We will be providing uh, 15 to start right now, at least 15. Um, and they're common set here which we think will help create more consistency in the process. Right now, many offices have probably many smart tools. And again, some use some, some use others, and are comfortable with, with, with certain things. So by providing a common set of smart tools, we think we put together ones that will help with this process uh, well and enhance grid composition so you can spend more time with mesoscale meteorology. And this data load and blend tool will be the one that we will start with um, in the test beds to populate the observations into the initial state. Well, we'll have to take a look at that. And that's where you guys will come into play. And that's where the grid team will continue to look at this and see how can we improve it if we decide that it's not doing a, a good job. The question always comes up uh, that, hey, I've got a couple tools here that we use that really handle this process better. Or maybe it's not in the smart tools that we give you. And can we use them? And, and, the, and the answer to that is yes. We know that. Our tools that we have can't account for everything. And really, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a tool that really you think is going to help uh, in other offices, then you know we may want to put that in the baseline tools that we give to other offices. Or <clears throat> excuse me, or at least a sorry about that, <clears throat> at least a cluster um, of offices that you're working with to, to enhance the process as well. So we'll continue to look in, in the need for additional and revised tools. Uh, as, as we go along. So smart tools actually uh, is in the test phase as well, besides the actual forecast. <clears throat> as far as collaboration goes, um, we don't know. The com this is another thing that we're going to test. We don't know. I mean, we collaborate today. We don't know the complexity of when we do enhanced short term. Could be a little bit messy, but we think with a common init, that should help in the very short term uh, part of it, the near term, so to speak, with uh, helping with collaboration, because uh, you're starting with a common uh, starting point here, just like we do in the extended. Um, but concentrate your efforts with fellow test bed offices, all right? Uh, it, it, could get a little, it may not match up as well with the non-test beds that are your neighbors, but as we do now when there's significant changes, don't obviously tell them, but concentrate on your test bed uh, partners. And if you're making changes to those later parts of the short term, as we mentioned before, uh, that's when model data becomes more important. That's when your typical NDFD, NDFD threshold should apply. But don't just 
collaborate and compromise the, so to meet a threshold. You know, collaborate science, and therefore the threshold will naturally be met. So grids may not look smooth. Uh, weather is not smooth, so that's not a concern, but we do want to strive to reduce that arbitrary discrepancies and those differences along our boundaries. Verification, uh, Boise Short or Boise Short, which is a version of Boise Verify, uh, will be coming to, to you through a tech order and for installation if you decide to participate here. Therefore, we can assess the short-term grids, the, these high-resolution models, the OBS, and try to see you know, how best to, to use this information and what applications from it to help uh, expedite and improve the process. We'll also use it to see if we can get a better quality uh, OBS database and then the NIT to get those OBS into our uh, grids to start. And as always, uh, you should use this information to provide feedback to, uh, for yourself uh, for personal reflection on the quality of your forecast and lessons learned from that. Other forecast services here, the AFDs. Now, that's a, that's a big one that we've, we've had a lot of uh, discussion about. As you know, AFDs are one of the most popular items that we, that we send out. You know, folks can't see our grids every time or don't know where to find that information on, on our websites. They do know and see the AFDs here, and they can see what our thinking is and what changes we're making. So we're going to require those, basically, for all tangible forecast changes. Now, that's a little ambiguous. Um, but if you're making an event-driven update, it's probably for a reason. So there's probably a, a reason to put out an AFD. Now, the length will vary. It could be a sentence or two. It could be a couple paragraphs. That's up to you, depending on the situation. Um, but, I mean, if you're raising temperatures from, like, 80, low 80s to mid 80s, and this, well, I guess you won't get that warm in a test bed period, but, okay, we'll down that. Okay, if you're if in the 30s to the mid 30s or upper 30s, then, you know, you maybe a short AFD, just to mention that, would probably be good. But if you're making just uh, very minor tweaks, it's a sunny day, there's really nothing going on, and you're just up in dew points, a couple degrees, or, or low end max temp a degree or so, then you really don't need to put out an AFD because it's really not a tangible change. We will provide in a common formatter for the test beds. I'm not quite sure how your AFDs go out. Some do short-term, long-term. Some do discussion. This particular formatter will do short-term, long-term with a update section on top, I believe, and it will be time-stamped so that folks can see when these particular updates and short-term uh, discussions were issued so they can put that in context. Um, if what you're doing now doesn't quite fit in with that or if you, you want to see how uh, you, know, you can kind of put those two together, then that's something we can still look at. So again, AFD formatters is another uh, thing on the table. We want to see what's the best way that we can put out information in a consistent basis from office to office. Update is needed to ensure consistency with the enhanced short term. So this is where these other uh, services come into play now. TAFs, there's really no change. We're not going to be doing aviation grids uh, as part of this test. But obviously, you're going to update the TAFs just as you do now to stay relevant and uh, in line with the enhanced short term forecast. Fire weather, huge out west. And marine, huge for you guys up in the Great Lakes. Um, you know your partners and your users better than we do. So the idea is as you would do today. Make sure that information is consistent with enhanced short term, so that's up to you locally how you go about doing that. Uh, as far as HWO, AFM, PFM, ZFP, Top News, and so on, again, no difference. Make sure it's, uh, it's uh, consistent. We're not saying you need to update it every time. For instance, the ZFP was designed to be a low res kind of general forecast that's not going to be able to resolve the detail we put into the short term, so if, if you update that, your forecast and that detail is not going to be reflected in your ZFP, there's probably no need to update that, especially if it's for a, a small change. If you do update it, though, it does put a later timestamp on it, so it does show that, hey, okay, maybe it's not a tangible difference, but at least it shows me that that forecast is still up to date. Um, and there's, all, there's some changes that will come to the ZFP that will evolve that product in the future as well, because that's basically a legacy product. Hazardous weather information, the headlines uh, during higher impact events, obviously we want to keep that in line with what we're doing. And this is a good area to leverage the operational team to assist as needed. All right, workload. This may, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know, it may seem like a lot at first, and that's natural when you make changes. And again, some folks do this uh, already, and so it may not be a big deal for them. Other folks, maybe it will be a little bit more. But there will be differences in the process and exactly what we do when we do it, so it 
could seem like a lot of workload at first, but once this becomes more habit and more routine like anything, it should become easier. But you will qualify, I'm sorry, you will quantify that and you will help us determine the ways for a most efficient process. Maybe something doesn't work. Hey, we need to know that so that we can uh, see how, what we can do in response. And as I mentioned here, some of you are already uh, doing this with great diligence. You're in the grids constantly, so that's good. And ways to mitigate that would be uh, through this common smart tool use. So we have more, uh, a little bit more uniform, have a more unified process here in what we do. Uh, and that then helps collaboration, which helps workload. The operational team and uh, the idea of a streaming relevant database, whereby, again, everything is not done at a couple, a few predefined times. It's, it's kept uh, constant relevant uh, throughout. It's this rolling database that always represents our best so that you don't have an inordinate amount of workload necessarily at certain times. I mean, that may not be eliminated uh, completely, obviously, but we're trying to spread that out and make sure the database is constantly relevant versus uh, updated at certain times, and therefore that spreads out the workload a little bit. Okay, here's a perspective from a few folks in the eastern region, as I mentioned before, uh, that they're already doing it. Some of this came from some of it came from forecasters, and this is just three comments that kind of summarizes what we received. And this was one, initially forecasters were concerned about too much work, and this person said that that's a common misconception, and that updates became second nature to them. Now, that didn't happen overnight. Uh, it didn't happen for a while. They've been working with it for a while. So again, when you change the process and the habits and our normal ways we like to do things, and those habits run deep, that, that can take time, okay? So uh, that's where we need to give things a chance. This comment said workload can be a challenge. Now, this is an office that does do aviation grids, which is part of that uh, workload, which we're not going to be doing. But that you're engaged for the entire shift. It's an aspect of the process, but automation helps. And that automation being some effective smart tool use that can help expedite the process a little bit. And this comment is, and I'm certain it's the correct path of the web service. Many customers want specific timing and location information and uh, need definitive decisions. And what we're trying to do here fulfills that need and is a natural result of the emphasis on decision support and that customers love it. Okay, just a couple more slides here. SharePoint site and feedback. Uh, we have a SharePoint site already on the Central Region server for the grid team. And now we've added a uh, enhanced short-term forecast uh, part of, of that uh, SharePoint site. It's still uh, being developed, it's still in its infancy, so uh, it'll be continue to be built upon as we go forward. Uh, eventually, we'll get those final philosophy and playbook documents up on there. There's already some training material and links in there to things that may help with uh, science, basically, in, in short term. Uh, but you guys may help us because you might learn some things as you go into testbed if you participate, some tips, some best practices, some good, some not so good, and that will help out your other testbed offices uh, know what's happening, and also the non-test beds kind of keep in the loop. And the smart tool documentation and a feedback form which is being developed. Now, as far as feedback goes, two things here. Uh, we need it from our users and partners, obviously. One thing you need to do is probably notify some of your key partners, say the media, because they are accustomed to seeing and getting things at certain times, and they need things by certain times for their, uh, you know, for their operations, so to speak. So you need to let them know that, hey, you may not get things at this one time, but whatever you get is our latest information and the most relevant information in the short term, and therefore you can count on that. And if you think something's late, it's not. You already got our latest. But we will see how that works out if sometimes their feedback is saying, hey, what you're doing is really hindering us versus helping us, and we need to know that so that we can see if we need to make adjustments. So that's why the benefits, the drawbacks, perception, and the utility to them is really important as well and we need to see that information. And then uh, forecast staff will have to fill out a uh, feedback form. Uh, it says every ship here. We want to try to require that because uh, inevitably we won't get one every ship of it. But the idea here is that we need information. And we can't see how this test is going and how to make it better unless we have information. And you guys are the suppliers of that information. So we would like if uh, folks could fill out a feedback form that we develop. It'll be short. It won't take uh, very long at all. But there will be a chance to have open response in there if they want to add more information. And it doesn't have to be after every shift, but it could be, say, the next day. 
you know, or, or, or as soon as possible so that we can see what the good things are uh, and what the challenges are. And at the end of the whole process, we'll do some exit interviews like they did in the short, or I'm sorry, in the uh, extended to kind of give you, uh, or give us a better feel for overall how did this help or hinder. Communication, points of contact. Obviously, communication, as in anything, is a huge uh, key here. So the test beds need to select a point of contact kind of as a local advocate. A forecaster would be good because he or she is most directly involved with the process. And you can ch choose a co-leader or a small team if you like, but we'd like to have one person who's kind of the primary person to communicate with us. Oops, go back. The uh, points of contact for this team are uh, five of us. There's, I believe, 10 or so members on the, the entire grid team. Uh, John Gagan, a lead out in uh, Springfield, Missouri, he is the head of the entire team. He's done a phenomenal job over the last few years with uh, everything that's going on. So he should take uh, extreme credit. But as far as the uh, actual enhanced short-term goes here, uh, Chuck Reif, lead over in Jackson, and I are the co-leaders. And we would be main people that you could submit questions to. If you have questions about smart tools, Andy Just, the lead in lacrosse, he's your guy. And if questions about verification and voice is short, Jeremy Martin, the lead forecaster in Goodland, he would be the person to contact. And then Roman Burde is the forecaster in Duluth. He can also help as an additional resource. And then finally, uh, Pete Browning in SSD in Central Region uh, will be your regional point of contact. And as with John, if it wasn't for Pete, we would be nowhere close to where we are today. He's done a phenomenal job. Bottom line, last slide, is that this is a formalized, unified effort to do what we always should be doing, and some of us are already doing, so that's great. We can use you guys to help lead this effort uh, to be an indispensable weather source. Uh, a weather, yeah, weather, or a source of weather information and service to our customers. It's a central part of our future. If you look at things, we're requiring eight scheduled updates a day. Right now, most offices do at least four, so that uh, simple math will tell you that that's about one or just slightly over one per shift. Now, that will change if, when you're doing event-driven updates during busy times, and that's where the operational team becomes more important. Uh, we'll be there for you. And let it be known that we don't have all the answers. Again, we built this foundation, which we think can be built upon pretty well, but you're going to tell us what works and doesn't work. And maybe we haven't considered every little nuance, uh, things that we need to look at. So that's why we test, and that's why you guys help us. Uh, but it probably will be messy at first. We kind of talked about some, but you got to give it a chance. It's not going to happen uh, first day, first week, first month, even after four months. <clears throat> there's going to be some concerns probably still going forward, but like we talked about, it's a big goal, it's worth attaining, and we need to try to do that to provide that indispensable service. So last thing I'll say is your opportunity is here. This is your chance to help us lead and then move the central region forward in our service. So I appreciate you hanging with me here. I'll talk maybe a little bit longer than I had planned, but uh, hopefully it answers some of your questions, and uh, the team members on the call will try to answer any questions you have now, and, and, and you have later too, we'll be glad to answer after the call. So I'll open up the floor, and thank you very much.